we are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escal. You heard me rant last week about Richard Branson's little uh, trip to subspace. Um, obviously, Jeff Bezos uh, flew to something like the Space Line this week. And my next guest has written a great piece about uh, the topic of space tourism. Darna Noor is a staff writer for Earther, which can be found at gizmodo.com slash Earther. She writes about energy, animals, why we shouldn't trust the private sector to solve the climate crisis, uh, three things I'm extremely uh, fond of talking about myself. And she can be found on Twitter at Darna, D-H-A-R-N-A, Noor, N-O-O-R. She joins us now. Her article is entitled Space Space tourism is a waste, which pr puts it pretty plainly. Darna Noor, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks so much for having me. So, as I was saying before we recorded, Darna, my own writing on this topic has been more or less a rant against billionaires in general, the insanity of them wasting taxpayer money as well as their own money on these jaunts while the planet is on fire. But you took a much smarter approach than I in many ways, <laughs> uh, which is you talked about the climate impact of uh, what it would actually mean to make space tourism a thing. So uh, why don't you start out by, if you don't mind, just giving us a brief overview of what you wrote. Sure. Um, I guess I, I can start by saying I think that a rant is a pretty uh, reasonable way to, to come at this issue. Um, it's pretty infuriating and pretty wild overall. Um, but, no, you know, for, for many reasons, um, not least of which uh, the climate impact of actually building out something like a space tourism sector would just be like impossibly horrible. Um, and, you know, this is not just say that I actually think that the purpose of these flights is just to build out something like a space tourism sector. Right. I understand that this is also to, you know, impress investors, um, to sort of garner more uh, government contracts for, you know, thing, from things like the Pentagon and things like this. Um, but, you know, if there were something one day like a space tourism sector, it would be really, really awful for the planet. Um, and that's for many reasons. Uh, so Bezos and Branson have both sort of taken the, the mantle of being like the climate focused billionaires, um, in addition to, of course, Elon Musk, who's going to be going to space uh, pretty soon, reportedly as well. Um, but we know that space travel can be really awful for uh, the atmosphere. Um, and that's in part because they emit pollution directly into the stratosphere. Um, so there's all these studies that show that that can really deplete the ozone layer. The ozone layer is really important, obviously. Um, it protects people and animals and everything on on Earth from the harmful ultraviolet rays that come from the sun, um, the same ultraviolet rays that we have been fighting for decades to rebuild, um, or rather the same ozone layer that we've been fighting for decades to rebuild after kind of depleting it uh, due to the chemicals we use in air conditioners. Um, and then there's also the actual climate effects to worry about, like the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and here again, Bezos and Branson both claim that they're you know, taking pretty carbon front or carbon neutral or climate friendly uh, trips up to suborbital space. But in reality, um, Branson took this uh, space plane that runs on a combination of nitrous oxide and this stuff called hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene, um, which is basically like a byproduct of using steam crackers to like uh, make petroleum or natural gas into something else. Very technical, but all you really need to know about it is that making it re releases tons of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and so does using it. Bezos's rocket is a little bit different. Um, he's really into the fact that he uses liquid hydrogen um, in his plane, that it runs on liquid hydrogen, um, which yeah, does not emit carbon when you actually use it. But again, making it requires tons and tons of carbon emissions because it's super energy intensive. Um, this is all really just very technical ways of saying that these are horrible fuels. Um, we're going to be using ridiculous amounts of it whenever we see these rockets uh, or space planes or whatever going up into space. And that is uh, not not good news for Earth. And isn't, you know, I could be completely off base about this, but isn't liquid hydrogen dangerous to transport and store? Or am I thinking of something else, liquid natural gas, maybe? 
It, cer it certainly can be. Um, and I don't know exactly how Bezos is liquid, liquid hydrogen liquid hydrogen is being produced and stored, um, et cetera. But this is all like part of the problem, right? Is that neither of them are being particularly forthcoming about where these fuels are coming from, about what exactly the carbon impact of all of these fuels are, um, if there's any risk to the workers who are producing them, transporting them, et cetera. There's just really not very much transparency overall. And I looked at Bezos, uh, you mentioned quite rightly that uh, both Bezos and uh, Branson uh, paint themselves as pro-environment and give money to certain environmental groups and so on. But when I looked into their giving, I saw nothing that, for example, might uh, inconvenience themselves uh, in terms of the nature of their expressed views on the environment. They're certainly not talking about overthrowing capitalism, for one thing, but they're not even talking about... Uh, you know, restructuring and reducing our energy usage or, uh, you know, any of the, the real accommodations it seems we're going to have to make in order to mitigate climate change. It seemed to me a kind of, and maybe I'm being unfair because I hate those guys, but uh, um, it seemed to me there was nothing in their purported environmentalism that uh, really challenge the status quo and the consumption and so on uh, uh, reality that currently exists. And it seems to me as if these space launches are almost doubling down on that by saying not only aren't we doing going to do that much for the environment, we're going to make it worse with our new quote unquote industry. Is, am I being unfair? Uh, I, I mean, I should say I also hate those guys, but I think I can pretty confidently say that that is a very fair uh, description of all of their climate efforts. Um, Branson, Bezos, Musk also. Uh, and this is kind of what we see from all of the billionaires who say that they're taking on the climate crisis or like say that they're going to be the saviors of, uh, of the environment or whatever it is. Um, it's never, you know, it's, it tends to be in these ways that are just kind of, you know, pushes to regulate themselves um, and are never really, they're never really pushing for any sort of regulations that would uh, harm the things that they're making profits of in the first place. Um, so Branson, I think, is maybe the most obvious example. Um, he owns uh, a major airline. We know that airlines are extremely polluting, uh, extremely environmentally unjust also because uh, you know, just something like 1% of people or of people who even fly in planes, which is also a tiny subset of the population, just something like 1% of people who even fly in planes are responsible for like 50% of all of the carbon emissions that even come from flying. Um, so super polluting, super environmentally unjust. Uh, and his, you know, solution to this is not maybe I shouldn't have an airline industry because of course that would cut into his right. profits and he's a capitalist titan. So never going to say that. Instead, it's let me let me offset uh, some of the emissions from you know from these flights, uh, and that of course does not actually cancel out the pollution and can also come with a whole host of other issues. Um, then you have someone like Jeff Bezos who says, "Oh, I'm going to give a, a whole bunch of money to all of these uh, kind of climate focused nonprofits." Which okay, maybe there's some good things that come out of that, but the problem is that when you you know, take money from someone like Jeff Bezos, you're also taking it on Jeff Bezos's terms. Um, I don't think that Bezos is going to anytime be funding projects that say, like you're saying, that we need to uh, think about alternatives to the capitalist system if we're really going to take on climate change or that we need to, you know, maybe uh, develop the economy in ways that prioritize something other than the profit growth of all of these billionaires. Um, so, yes, I, I think it's very fair to say that uh, these efforts are not, uh, you know, certainly not anything that's going to be uh, hurting them. And uh, and certainly also, I don't think anything that's really going to be taking on the crisis, the scale that it demands. And I agree. Not only do I agree 100 percent, Darna, but I also, you know, Jeff Bezos's business model I mean, two other thoughts. One is Jeff Bezos's business model. If you're a Prime member, for example, and I buy one pen, like the pen I hold in my hand, but I want it by, you know, I don't know the details, six o'clock or eight o'clock tonight or first thing tomorrow morning, and I pay a little bit extra for that, he will send the vehicle 
to, and part of this is because he's, you know, reinforcing his monopoly, but right now, anyway, he'll send a vehicle to deliver this, you know, 99 cent pen to my door, which of course is also horrible for the environment and for fuel consumption. And he's never said, for example, I'm going to change my entire way of doing business so that everybody can get one delivery a week, and that way I'll cut down on my fuel consumption. That has never happened. That's that's my comment number one. And my comment number two is when you take money from Jeff Bezos, I feel that it's very tough for even a good, dedicated person not to think, well, I, I would, as part of my environmental work, rail against the overconsumption of delivery companies like Amazon. But, you know, the good work that I'm doing might not be funded the next time around if I do that. And I feel that it's another form of green mail or self-protection. Uh, I on the second point first, I guess I agree 100%. Um, when Bezos announced, uh, I guess it was last year, his major climate fund, uh, I wrote a piece for Earther at Gizmodo called Let's Not Rely on Billionaires to Solve the Climate Crisis for Us. Um, and I, I agree 100%. Part of the problem with taking these funds is that you're beholden really to whatever the terms of the funding is. Um, and that could certainly put a damper on criticism of Amazon for, I mean, like, like you're saying for things like uh, shipping a pen across the country just to get it to you on time, but also, you know, things like producing hundreds of millions of pounds of plastic waste, um, spewing toxic and planet heating gases out of uh, thousands of vehicles and warehouses all over the country. Um, also, you know, not even just the actual production and things like this, but Bezos's company, Amazon, also helps oil companies to actually extract fossil fuels more efficiently. Like one of their other products is mm -hmm. that they will actually work with oil companies companies and make them uh, technologies that will help them to extract oil more efficiently. Um, so yes, in many ways, I mean, uh, defending uh, Amazon is, is certainly, I think, from an environmental perspective, completely impossible, uh, must as much as Bezos may try. And again, we're talking with Darna Noor, whose article in Gizmodo is uh, headlined, uh, Space Tourism is a Waste. I, I know we don't always write our own headlines, Darna, but uh, it's a good headline. Uh, uh, whoever came, whether it was you or your editors, it, it's, well, it's... thank you. I can't take credit for that one, but thanks. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, and uh, let's talk for a minute about space tourism, which is basically, to me, taking the destructive, self-indulgent vanity of Branson and Bezos' own little jaunts and selling it to others uh, with uh, maybe not as much disposable income to dispose of, but a, a lot, because we're talking about, I don't know what uh, a Bezos would charge, but Branson is talking about charging two hundred and fifty to $300,000 a seat for, I guess, what, a 20 minute, a 20 mile trip where you get to see the curvature of the earth more clearly and maybe you throw up and then you come back, to, you know, but people want to do it to be able to say, uh, they've gone to space or whatever, and uh, presumably they think there's a market for it and with inequality and so on. I'm sure there are enough people willing to burn, uh, you know, a, a quarter of a million dollars or more for a few minutes ride. But uh, uh, what? first of all, let's start with this. Um, do you think or do people you've talked to think that it's a viable business because get before we even get to whether it's good bad uh because i've heard a couple different opinions about uh, whether there are even enough people out there who would uh, pay for this to actually make it a thing um i've also kind of heard differing opinions um and i think kind of where i come down on it is it's certainly not going to be a viable business for the masses, right? Like they can say all they want that the purpose of these companies, uh, SpaceX, uh, Virgin Galactic, whatever it is, they can say that the purpose is like this sort of populist mission of bringing space to everyone. Um, but we know like just from looking at the price tag that that's not true. Um, as you mentioned, Virgin Galactic flights, I think are going for, for a quarter million dollars, maybe a little bit less than that now. But even if it comes down to a fraction of that, there's no way that like there's going to be a mass market for just ordinary people who are struggling to pay their rent and find jobs and things like this. You know, ordinary people uh, like us are not going to be buying uh, rocket flights for a quarter million dollars or even, frankly, like ten thousand um, dollars. 
So certainly I don't think there's going to be a mass market, at least not anytime soon. And I think ever, um, but, you know, not having a mass market doesn't mean that they're not going to offer this as a service to a select few people. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that I think, you know, one uh, argument I've been kind of convinced by is that this is not really uh, a ploy to create a new industry of space tourism for everyone. It's a way to sort of impress investors. Um, and, you know, if you can comp a flight from your fellow fellow billionaire friends um, from an investor who might be really useful to you down the line. And you're the only person who they can say, oh, I'm going to be working with this guy who can literally take me up to suborbital space. That might be a pretty convincing argument. Um, so, you know, there will be a market in that sense. And also, you know, again, like there's definitely a market for uh, these uh, kind of space missions and things like this to be used for other purposes. Um, like, you know, there's certainly uh, the Pentagon might look at this and say, oh, well, you can build a rocket. What else can you build that we can send into space or what other kinds of technologies can you build uh, on a on short term notice or whatever it is? Um, so as basically giant ads in the sky, giant billboards that say, look how much technological uh, prowess my company has, look how much money I have, look how much I can get my workers to do for me for so little money. Um, you know, okay. in that way, sure. I think that it could certainly be a sort of advertisement for all the companies who are doing it. And that raises a really important point. Again, we're talking with Darna Noor uh, about her piece, Space Tourism is a Waste. That raises such an important point because, uh, you know, when the United States... Uh, decided when John Kennedy gave his speech about going to the moon um, and uh, you know there were a controversy then and now about whether that was a appropriate expenditure of public funds and all that but uh, the whole point of investing in a manned uh, space flight to the moon was that it was going to be done by the public for the public that it, you know that the it, propaganda if you want to call it that or national community building if you want to look at it another way uh, that the whole that whole aspect of it was driven about the fact that this was the american people doing it you know together and all that and uh, and the heroism of our you know astronauts who are you know public servants and and now it seems to me it's just, well no we're going to take it, it, it seems to me part of this larger trend of taking public resources public wealth public knowledge uh public ideas giving them to private sector uh actors and letting them take all the credit a hundred percent uh and further letting them take all the credit and not really uh showing any public benefits right like if right. you um, it, there's good reasons, I think, for going to space. Um, you know, you can kind of use satellites uh, to track weather patterns, to track the way that the climate is changing. You can even just learn more about, like, if there's extraterrestrial life. Um, all of that, I think, is worthy. And, you know, those should all be, uh, those are all functions that should be served by the public sector. But we're not really gaining anything at all from three more rich guys going up into rockets, uh, seeing the edge of space, and then coming back. Like, that's very nakedly just, uh, you know, done for their benefits uh, to like live out their childhood dreams or, you know, feel like they uh, can make their five-year-old selves proud or whatever it is. Um, there's really not a whole lot of technological benefit that we can get from that. Um, unlike something like, you know, space travel for, uh, you know, the sort of mission of gaining more knowledge about what it means to be a living being on earth. Yeah. Well said. And, and of course, what they get out of the billionaire, Richard Branson gets to dress up in a uniform that looks like a cast off from the Galaxy Quest wardrobe catalog. And, and you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's not only is it outrageous, Darna, it's freaking embarrassing. I mean, I, I find the ego and the immaturity and the vanity of these guys, if they weren't billionaires, people would be saying, you're a freaking idiot. It's true. And uh, I, mean, I mean, you don't have to agree with me, but that is the way I feel. Um, what do you think? I, I certainly agree. I think it's very embarrassing. Uh, I mean, you the, the mere image of like a grown man who is the richest man in the world wearing a cowboy hat and an astronaut uniform at the same time. Like you, you look at that and you're like, are you 
Would you also I, like a pinata and an ice cream cake? Uh, <laughs> you, like? right. Well, it made me think of, I'm sorry, Darn you knew it, but it oh, made no. me think of, uh, you saw Dr. Strangelove, right? Uh, it made me think of, what was his name? Slim uh, Pickens riding the nuclear bomb, waving his 10-gallon hat exactly. you know, at the very end. I uh, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the image didn't cross Bezos' mind before he put that, uh, that cowboy hat on that morning, too. Well, I hope it didn't, because Slim <laughs> Pickens was depicted as rightfully as an idiot in that movie. Um, so... Uh, I'm trying to figure out now how we, uh, first of all, how we communicate about this going forward, because I think it's an opportunity. I think your piece was a great contribution to it, uh, but I think that this is a, the sort of a teaching moment, if you will, for uh, us to talk about the stupidity of, as well as the, you know, structural violence of inequality that these guys have such ludicrous amounts of money that they can do this about the inappropriateness of public resources, public wealth going to these guys and of uh, the just stupidity of billionaires. But uh, I mean, a group of people who are largely self-selected for their, you know, predatory instincts and not, little else. So, um, but other than that, how can we build, in your opinion, how can we, talk to people about this moment and kind of communicate what's going on. I mean, I, I honestly think that there are a lot of people who are seeing through this. Uh, I think it's pretty nakedly uh, profit seeking behavior. Uh, and I think that, you know, despite the fact that there was just like a slew of fawning media coverage, uh, the morning of Bezos's flight, the morning of Branson's flight, uh, when, uh, Musk had that meeting months ago with Trump about how he was going to, you know, make space tourism a thing. I think that there's a lot of people, despite all of that glowing media coverage, that are really seeing through this. Um, so I think that the question maybe then is just to like where where we should divert uh, our sort of energies instead, where we should uh, put our put our focus instead, um, and frankly, like how we can also stop this kind of behavior from happening again, not just in space tourism, right, but any sort right. of behavior that makes billionaires richer is I think unsustainable from the population's perspective. Like it's bad for society. It's bad for the planet. It's just, it's not sustainable behavior at all. Um, and, you know, I think that one pretty clear uh, way that we can sort of show the naked, uh, you know, disgustingness of this behavior is to contrast it with something like the fires happening in the West right now um, right. or the floods happening in China right now. I mean, I think that it really doesn't take somebody who's like paying that close attention to all of this to see how absurd it is for billionaires to be taking these endlessly expensive flights uh, up off of Earth while Earth itself is, you know, producing crushingly horrible conditions um, for so many people. Um, but I think it's also up to uh, folks in the media, folks like us, to make the connection and show that, you know, those two things are not unrelated, um, to show that it's not uh, just that there happens to be a sort of billionaire class that's able to do things like go to space and a class of especially uh, poor people of color around the world, um, but really many people around the world who are exposed to this extreme weather, but rather that those are part of the same system, that the same system that allows million billionaires to amass that much wealth and that much power is the same one that is producing the conditions that allow oil companies and, you know, companies like Amazon and uh, Virgin and, and others to pollute at that at that degree. And you, uh, uh, you wrote a follow-up piece, Darna Noor in Gizmodo Earther, Wall E tried to warn us. I love that movie so much. I watched it twice. I watched. I gave my wife the 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 picture book, the children's picture book of Wall E for her birthday because she loved it too. The, um, but it, uh, in your lead, you say you were sick in bed when Jeff Bezos took his little trip in a dick-shaped bracket, as you kindly put point out um and you had you watched all the fawning coverage and that um uh you tuned it out i'm sorry excuse me uh all the fawning news uh coverage <laughs> which reminds me of something i read which was striking and I, I couldn't find it before our interview i will find it at some point which is an article that said that um 
that the flight of Jeff Bezos got more coverage in one day in the mainstream media than climate change has gotten in a year. And if that's true, that's that's a devastating statement on uh, on our media and our society. Um, but uh, you you want shall you remind our audience what Wally is about, or or, or shall I? Um, yeah, sure. I'm I'm happy to. Uh, I also saw that those those numbers that Media Matters ran, um, and I think that they were. Horrific, uh, but not at all surprising. Um, our media, all forms of media, have a very, very long way to go in terms of actually, uh, you know, displaying the climate crisis uh, for the existential threat that it is. Um, but Wally uh, is an incredibly prescient uh, Pixar movie that came out more than a decade ago, actually. That is, I think, shows some pretty clear parallels to. The sort of uh, present that we're seeing unfold today um, in the movie, this sort of global mega corporation that kind of conjures up uh, Walmart uh, vibes um, has destroyed the earth completely and transformed it into basically like a wasteland that has trash everywhere. Nothing can grow there. Um, no plant life. There's really no animals left. Um, there's only one cockroach that's either not uh, perished or escaped to spend eternity on the spaceship called the Axiom. And the Axiom uh, is run by the same company that has destroyed the Earth. And there, there's a bunch of humans who are, you know, left to basically have their muscles atrophy and uh, they spend all day in these hover chairs and they move around between different fast food restaurants, watching little screens of what life was once. Um, and are, you know, basically left with like a semblance of what human life was uh, and don't have any sort of interactions with other living things, really even with each other, um, which I think kind of shows that the utopian future that folks like Jeff Bezos and Bronson and Musk paint of moving into space uh, to escape the climate crisis which frankly, I don't think is possible. Um, but I think that it shows that if that was even possible, it really would not be utopian at all. That's a dystopia. Uh, there is no utopian world where we are all beholden to these major corporations on a space shuttle that is either on Mars or in Earth's orbit or whatever it is. Uh, I would definitely recommend a, re a rewatch if it's been a while since you've seen it. Uh, oh, I, good, thank you. I'm going to do that. Um, the uh, I always thought it was interesting that uh, the spaceship was named the Axiom, which is a statement that everybody just assumes is true. Uh, so I was wondering, what's the Axiom that that name refers to? Uh, I guess it's the belief that, my theory anyway, is that it's the belief that technology will, uh, in these hands, corporate hands, will always improve life. And that, yeah. that but you know what else it, it, all this reminds me of, Darna, is uh, if you saw the movie Elysium, um, which for, I think it was called Elysium, which wasn't as good, in my view, as, as, uh, as uh, Wally, -E, but it was interesting. Did you see it? I have not seen it, but I think you're the third person this week who said that I should. Um, yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds like there's really similar parallels to be found. Yeah, it's by the South African filmmaker who did District 9, if you saw that. And it, the earth is basically the ghetto at this point, just polluted and destroyed and impoverished, which seems to be where we're headed. But there is a kind of paradisical city in space um, that, or, quote unquote, ordinary people can't get it. So it's obviously like H.G. Wells' time machine. It's a metaphor for our society, right? 99% of the people are struggling. 1% of the people live in indescribable luxury that's the setup and there's a plot and an adventure and all that stuff but really wally -E is the one that holds up but you should see you know i recommend also that you know just for your own enjoyment because you're thinking about this stuff that you see uh elysium as well but you know we don't want to end our lives uh in a dystopian science fiction movie we've been trying to avoid that all along so what are you going to write about next, do you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, in terms of space, I think, uh, unfortunately, there will be no shortage of these stupid flights to write about in the future. Uh, and again, I think that it's sort of 
our job to, I don't think that anyone needs convincing on the fact that they're stupid. I think that most people can see that. Um, but I think that maybe, maybe it's our job to sort of draw the connections between um, the planetary destruction that this profit seeking behavior is creating. And uh, you know, the fact that uh, those profits can send people like Jeff Bezos to space. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that this is only one of many, many sectors where we're seeing horrendous growth, uh, at expense at the expense of the planet and most people on earth um so you know i will certainly be following many of those whether it's um you know the space tourism industry or the more mundane ones like the oil and gas industry or big agriculture uh, and others like this and part of the reason i think this is so important actually as i said in the article that i wrote about wally is that you know in wally we can screw up the earth completely and then at least some of us can leave and sort of find a new future in space somewhere. Uh, but I think that in the real world, that's actually not going to be possible. I think that we kind of have one shot. And if we screw it up, I mean, not to say that like, it's too late to do anything about the climate crisis or anything like that. But at a certain point, like if we pass certain thresholds, we will always, we will always benefit from uh, actions that can slow climate change and can help people to withstand uh, the changing climates conditions. Uh, but I, like, we can't, ruin earth completely go up to space and then wait for it to get back to normal and come back here like this is the only uh planet that i think we really have to uh to live on and i think that that means that we have to fight for it what's that saying there is no planet b so well hang on. all right well darna noor again i encourage everybody to read the article space tourism is a waste and to read the Wally article and see the movie if they haven't. Again, Darna Noor writes for uh, Gizmodo, for Gizmodo's Earther uh, publication, which is at gizmodo.com slash Earther. So Darna, thanks for the great writing and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks so much and thanks for the great show. Oh, my pleasure. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow and you're listening to And This Is The Zero Hour.